Welcome back to the playlist on amino acid catabolism. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about the degradation of methionine and threonine. Now, this particular uh, picture on the left also shows sort of a, as my teacher called, a poof synthesis for isoleucine on the left and valine on the right. Uh, it says six steps and seven steps respectively. Uh, we're actually going to go into the full catabolism of those amino acids in other videos. And actually those particular amino acids, their, their catabolism is actually fairly unintuitive, um, fairly complicated and convoluted. So we're actually going to have a separate video for each of the branch chain amino acids. Okay? In this video, we're only going to focus on methionine and threonine catabolism. The first one we'll do is methionine catabolism. Now, whether you realize it or not, you're actually already familiar with part of the catabolic pathway for methionine. And that's what I have written here on the right side of the screen. We're actually going to look at the SAM cycle. So let's find methionine on here. Here's methionine, right? Oops, let me get my brush. Get my brush. Here is methionine right there. There's methionine, right? And methionine is going to first get consumed by methionine adenosyl transferase. So once again, sort of an unusual beginning to an enzymatic pathway because we're actually going to have to consume an ATP first. So methionine is going to react with methionine adenosyl transferase, and that's going to give you SAM. Or what you can sort of consider, you might even consider that the first part of the reaction or the first part of the degradation pathway just starts with SAM, okay, which is, of course, s adenosyl methionine. And then, of course, you have to have a methyl transferase. You have to have a methyl transferase that transfers the methyl group, which is right here, is right here, to some other molecule. And that, of course, generates s adenosyl homocysteine. And you might even consider the first part of the degradation pathway beginning with s adenosyl homocysteine. And remember that that molecule is often abbreviated SAH, s adenosyl homocysteine. Okay, so now we're really going to begin. Um, we're really going to begin with the degradation. In fact, you almost could consider methionine adenosyl transferase and the methyl transferase. Those are really biosynthetic. Those are really biosynthetic reactions. Really, the first uh, degradative enzyme is going to be s adenosyl homocysteine hydrolase, and that's the one shown right here. So s adenosyl homocysteine hydrolase is going to hydrolyze off the adenosine in the substitution reaction, specifically a bimolecular substitution, and you're going to get homocysteine. Okay, so that homocysteine, that homocysteine is what's shown right here. Now, homocysteine is going to react with an enzyme called cystathionine beta synthase. Now, when we get to biosynthesis, there's also a cystathionine gamma synthase. And I want you to definitely be able to distinguish between the two. This one is cystathionine beta synthase. And it's going to use serine in a pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzyme. And it's going to synthesize this guy right here, with, which is cystathionine. Okay. Then cystathionine is quickly going to get consumed by cystathionine gamma lyase, a pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzyme that kicks off cysteine. And we're going to get alpha ketobutyrate. Now, just like in the case of cystathionine beta synthase, there is also a cystathionine beta lyase. Okay, So make sure that when you get to biosynthesis, um, later on that you are able to distinguish between the two. This one is going to be cystathionine gamma lyase, and it's ultimately going to convert cystathionine to cysteine and alpha ketobutyrate. Okay, now alpha ketobutyrate is the convergence point between methionine catabolism and threonine catabolism. So right now, let's also focus on threonine catabolism. Okay. So threonine catabolism is going to begin with threonine dehydratase. Now, keep in mind also that we've already seen one mode of threonine catabolism, okay? That was in the very first video we did on actual pathways of amino acid degradation, okay? And that got consumed by threonine dehydrogenase. Make sure you are able to distinguish between threonine dehydrogenase and threonine dehydratase. Threonine dehydratase is specifically going to um, 
it's going to convert 3-amine to alpha-ketobutyrate. And one thing you need to also keep in mind is that alpha-ketobutyrate is something we call an alpha-keto acid. That's going to be important in just a minute. But 3-amine dehydratase is a pyridoxal phosphate-dependent enzyme. Okay? In the first step of the mechanism, it's going to kick off water. And that water that it kicks off comes from this hydroxyl group right there. And I hope that makes sense. Then the last step of the mechanism, it's going to kick off ammonia in a shift-based hydrolysis. Okay, so remember shift-based hydrolysis, and if you need help predicting those products, we have a video on that. But remember that when you do a shift-based hydrolysis and you kick off ammonia, you should be left with a carbonyl. And the carbonyl that you see here is characteristic of alpha-ketobutyrate. Okay, now... If you think back to the TCA cycle and pyruvate dehydrogenase, those particular enzymes were part of a, a larger class of enzymes called alpha-ketoacid dehydrogenases. And in fact, if you've seen beta oxidation already, there was an enzyme called alpha-ketoadipate dehydrogenase, and alpha-ketoadipate was also an alpha-keto acid. So this is a large group of enzymes, and they all have the exact same mechanism. In fact, um, this particular reaction is showing that it uses coenzyme A and NAD. So they use FAD, lipoic acid, thiamine pyrophosphate, coenzyme A and NAD. So that mechanistically, they're all exactly the same. The difference between the alpha-keto acids is going to be this group over here, which we can call essentially the R group. But they're all alpha-keto acids, so alpha-ketobutyrate is going to react with alpha-keto acid dehydrogenase and that's going to give you this guy right here which is if I can find my mouse can't see because of the white screen propionyl CoA and we've already seen the catabolism of propionyl CoA but just so we can see it again we'll draw it down here so here's going to be propionyl CoA so propionyl CoA propionyl CoA is first going to react with an enzyme called propionyl CoA carboxylase so this is going to be propionyl CoA carboxylase. And if you recall, this enzyme was an ATP-dependent, biotin-dependent carboxylase. And you can also say that not only is it biotin-dependent, not only is that the coenzyme, but it also is going to require bicarbonate. Right? It's a bicarbonate-dependent enzyme, and it's also going to use ATP. So out of this reaction, you should also expect to get ADP. Okay, and so what you're going to do is you're essentially going to carboxylate it. You're going to carboxylate this, and you're specifically going to carboxylate right here. And what should happen when you carboxylate there is you should specifically get the D isomer of this molecule. You should get the D isomer. And this molecule has a special name. It's called D, it's called D methylmalonyl, methylmalonyl CoA. Okay, and specifically, it's the D isomer. Okay, and then this is going to react with another enzyme called methylmalonyl CoA epimerase. Okay, and it's going to epimerize this carbon right here, the carbon that I'm highlighting. So, methylmalonyl CoA epimerase. So, when I'm drawing this, if you were to indicate stereochemistry, this should be the L isomer now. So in other words, it's going to flip the stereochemistry about that carbon. And if you need more detail on this pathway of propionyl CoA catabolism, we have a whole video of it in the beta oxidation playlist. Okay. So this molecule is called L-methylmalonyl CoA. Okay. It's the L isomer. In other words, this enzyme labeled as B, this is methylmalonyl CoA epimerase, and it epimerizes that carbon this carbon right here, and it changes the stereochemistry. Okay, so now we're on to the final enzyme, and this is a cobalamin-dependent enzyme. It's a B12-dependent enzyme, and maybe one day we'll have the mechanism of this enzyme in a video. But this enzyme, labeled C, is called methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. And what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to essentially essentially it's going to move this carboxyl group and put it right here okay so the product you're going to get is this and this is a very important product and I'll give you a moment to pause the video and I'll, I'll see if you can figure out where we've seen this before and what its name is and I'll assume that you've had a go at it and this molecule is called succinyl it's called succinyl S-CoA 
We just saw how propionyl CoA gets converted into succinyl CoA. Now let's think about what happens to the succinyl CoA with respect to the hepatocytes that are doing this process. And we always have to keep this in the back of our mind. With the exception of the branch chain amino acids, which are valine leucine and isoleucine, which were featured in that picture, uh, we have to keep in mind that the other 17 amino acids tend to be degraded mostly in the liver. And so what the job of the liver is, is it's to produce ketones bodies and glucose that can be dumped into the blood and supply extra hepatic tissues. Well, what we saw in another video when we did threonine dehydrogenase, that particular threonine catabolic pathway, threonine got degraded to 2-amino-3-ketobutyrate, and then that got consumed by 2-amino-3-ketobutyrate CoA ligase, and you produce an acetyl-CoA. So in that video, we saw that threonine in one part was uh, ketogenic. And the reason it's ketogenic is because it ultimately formed acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA can then go into ketone body uh, biosynthesis by the liver cells. And then once you make acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, the liver cell can dump those into the blood and they can go to extrahepatic tissues. But what we're going to find in this video um, at least the rest of this, is that the succinyl-CoA is a glucogenic product, not ketogenic. Because threonine gets degraded to succinyl-CoA here, um, we're going to see that threonine is both ketogenic and glucogenic. Okay? However, methionine is only degraded into glucogenic products. Therefore, methionine is not ketogenic. It's only glucogenic. Okay, so let's deal with succinyl-CoA. And what this is, is essentially just the TCA cycle, right? So succinyl-CoA is going to react with succinyl-CoA synthetase, and that's going to give us a nucleoside triphosphate that can power the cell, at least the liver cell that's doing this process, right? And in the process, we're going to get succinate. Now, succinate is going to react with succinate dehydrogenase, or complex 2 of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And that's going to give us a reduced coenzyme Q, right? Initially, the electrons are going to go to FAD, reducing it to FADH2. But we know that FADH2 is not the terminal electron acceptor. The FADH2 is going to transfer its electrons through a series of iron sulfur centers. And they're ultimately going to end up uh, reducing oxidized ubiquinone into reduced ubiquinol. And the reduced ubiquinol is what we see as coenzyme Q in the reduced state. Okay, And succinate dehydrogenase is also going to give us fumarate. So in other words, fumarate is two electrons short of succinate. Okay, because the two electrons from succinate went to coenzyme Q, and now we have fumarate. Now, fumarate is going to react with fumarate hydratase, and nothing really interesting happens in this reaction other than the fact that it's an addition reaction across an alkene or a hydration of an alkene. And what we're going to get is L-malate. Okay, so if you were to assign DL stereoisomerism based on this carbon right here that I'm highlighting in yellow, you would call it the L isomer. The D isomer of malate is not observed. Okay, so L malate is going to react with L malate dehydrogenase. And this is an NAD dependent oxidation. And essentially what's going to happen is this hydroxyl group that's on malate is going to get oxidized into a carbonyl, specifically because there are carbons on either side of that hydroxyl carbon, the product is going to be a ketone. And we note that over here in the ketone structure of oxaloacetate. Okay, so malate dehydrogenate's immediate product is oxaloacetate, but in the process of oxidizing the hydroxyl group, we end up reducing NAD into NADH. In other words, when we funnel succinyl-CoA into the TCA cycle, our energy-yielding products are going to be a nucleoside triphosphate where the nitrogenous base is guanine or adenine, Reduced CoQ and NADH, and we know that coenzyme Q reduced, or ubiquinol, is going to fuel complex 3 of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. Specifically, it's called cytochrome C ubiquinol oxidoreductase. The NADH will feed into NADH ubiquinol oxidoreductase, or complex 1. Okay, now the oxaloacetate has a special function in the liver cells. Um, keep in mind that uh, oxaloacetate in other cells would normally get consumed by citrate synthase. But keep in mind that the liver cells are running constantly on beta oxidation. The oxaloacetate will move to another pathway. And the oxaloacetate is going to move into gluconeogenesis. Okay, So the liver cells are going to express a large amount of the enzymes needed for gluconeogenesis. Okay, So the oxaloacetate will ultimately, uh, through some mechanism, leave the mitochondrial matrix, end up in the cytosol, and it will go through the 
approximately uh, 10 enzymes in gluconeogenesis that exist in the cytosol to make glucose. And the liver cells will make the glucose, um, dump it into the, into the bloodstream, and it will go and serve extra hepatic tissues. So we've seen now what the purpose of the succinyl-CoA is. The succinyl-CoA's purpose is to fuel the TCA cycle of the liver cell that's doing this process to ultimately make oxaloacetate so that you can make glucose in gluconeogenesis. So because threonine and methionine do this process, we can say that both of them are glucogenic because they're, they're, they're generating um, products in catabolism like succinyl-CoA that can be used ultimately to make glucose, so they're glucogenic. Methionine is not ketogenic, however. Okay? However, threonine, because it has another pathway of catabolism that we did in another, in another video, threonine um, is ketogenic and the reason it is because the catabolism in that particular pathway yielded acetyl-CoA. So threonine, ketogenic and glucogenic, methionine only glucogenic. See you in the next video.